after uh, missing a week last week, it is Tuesday night, and that means another episode episode of Goal Horns and Fight Songs. Uh, my bad for missing last week. Uh, still a good weekend of hockey. I was just tired, and I slept through five alarms, so Wes is not happy with me this week. Uh, but we do have a returning guest with us this week. <laughs> Hello. What? Oh, yeah. Uh, welcome back, Brent Br- uh, Bean. On Twitter, he is OMAV's hockey fan. Uh, you may remember him from about a month or so ago. Some great conversation, getting uh, filling us in on what hockey is like down there in Omaha. Um, we figured this would be a great time to have you back on as your in-between series with the teams that Mike and I follow closest. Um. And I really, just don't want to talk to him right now. And like, o- I just really know. you know, Omaha's been making a pretty good push here in the second half of the season. So, yeah, it's been it's been fun to. Uh, I mean, it's kind of happened last season, and I think the boys, after having uh, a pretty up and down, I'd say first half, especially in the NCHC, I think they're finally understanding now that uh, you know it's it's time to get down in the nitty gritty. And if we want to want to stay near that home ice, which is what they did last weekend, uh, sweeping, I mean, they're just, I think, four points back now home ice, which is, if you would have told me two weeks ago before the St. Cloud series that we would be this close, I would have, I would have laughed in your face. But now the team just knows how to keep us, uh, keep us on the ed- edge of our seats when it's, when it's that time of the year, so... And I mean, not only are they receiving votes to be in the rankings, they are squarely actually in the top 20 rankings this weekend or this week. It's great. We love it. Can't. I'm just so happy we're ranked still. And I got to get a little bit higher. You're still kind of bubble team, I think, at the moment as far as the pairwise goes, but on the climb for sure. Yeah. Um, You know, these these last few weeks, if you are make or break for – for some teams, um, I would put Western in that category this year. I would put Omaha in that category. Um, you know, if if one of those teams doesn't win the, the tournament, they've got to have a real strong finale here because the teams we're playing are going to be higher in the rankings. The, the St. Cloud States, the Denvers, the North Dakotas. I mean, those teams have been Western for the most part has been bumping around that, that 10 spot. So there's some spots to be gained in the pairwise by by playing well here at the end of the conference run, and unfortunately we've seen it with Nebraska a couple times or Omaha. What I don't know what you guys re- are refer to yourselves as, but uh, you know they have unfortunately a, a weaker non-conference schedule, so they really put a lot of emphasis on what they can do in conference. And there's been some years where it has kind of bitten them in the butt, and other years where I think they were super close to being on the edge and just got bumped by a low seed tournament winner. Yeah. It's uh, something we talked about on an Omaha, Omaha hockey Twitter. Um, this season is um, Arizona state having a rough weekend, a rough Friday night against Lindenwood um, with the, I think they won in a shootout. So it ended in a tie on Friday. That one kind of sucks having uh, the overtime loss to Arizona state. And then, Earlier this season, the Ohio State weekend was um, a bit of a sleeper for us, and that's really going to bite us in the butt at the end of the season. Ohio State, obviously, one win in the Big Ten this year. Um, and, I mean, they're still, I think, mid-30s in the pairwise just because they, they play in the Big Ten. So there's a couple weekends. Obviously, thankfully, we, we got the business done. We're not going to have a Niagara, you know, sinking our ship this this year, but there's a couple series that are definitely going to uh, impact the end of the season that might come back and, and unfortunately be the reason why we don't make it. But there's a couple, you know, even we have six NCHC wins in overtime. Um, and if you even move a couple of those to regulation wins or um, anything like that, I mean, that even would help us too. So these next couple, these next couple of series are huge when it comes to the pairwise with, uh, CC being one above, well, actually tied, but uh, CC's RPI being just a little bit better, and then Western just a couple places in front of us. So um, this weekend, and then uh, a couple weekends from now, when CC comes to Omaha, are, are 
even in the NCHC standings are going to be paramount. Um, as I tweeted, uh, I think it was Sunday that, I mean, this, especially this weekend, this is the one we're going to look back at uh, as Omaha fans and be like, well, if we swept cool, that means we're probably top four where um, you look back and it's like, yeah, we, we did what we were supposed to do then at that point in the season. And um, you know, but if we, if we lose out on, on, I'd say like three or more, if we only get two or three points this weekend, I think it's kind of a, you know, that's, that's where we kind of could have taken a big step in proving that we could compete. And, and obviously last season, I think we might've overachieved on um, some things, but um, yeah, I mean, this season or this, this weekend is huge. Yeah. I mean, there's only two series being played this weekend. So some opportunities for points to be made up uh, a little bit here with only, um, you know, half the conference inactive, but not not going to be an easy go at it for your team or mine. Um, both of these teams play each other extremely well. They're very fun series to watch. And really, I want to get into last weekend here first, though, and a great series between Duluth and, and Omaha this weekend. It got a little chippy, I think, in game two. Um, you know, some frustration, I think, sinking in for Duluth, both with injuries, not necessarily being where they want to be in the conference. They're sitting in seventh right now. Uh, a good deal between them and Miami, but still not the season. I, I think they were expecting to have, um, and really Steve's being the only bright spot who I think Omaha kind of handled pretty well. I don't know that he was too dangerous down there, but a player that is, if he's on the ice, you got to keep track of him and keep account of him. And I think even um, the Friday series, which I watched more of, uh, there was chippiness that was starting to bleed in already in that series. Like just guys were getting there because the frustration was coming back in. It was close after one. It might have even been close after two, if I remember. But then all of a sudden, you guys just, you were the better team. Omaha was the better team, and it wasn't even yeah. close. Uh, and the game had the feel of Omaha just being the better team overall. Watching it, it was like, we're lucky we're down. I think it was 2-1 after one. Mm -hmm. It was like, yeah, we're lucky to be here. Okay, 3-1. Uh, we kind of hung in there, and then it just... I gave up on the game, honestly. If, I, if I'm being realistic, I, as I was watching it, it was just like... We have no chance. We are a terrible team right now, <laughs> other, other than Ben Steves. Yeah, I think... Um obviously being at the game, you could tell Omaha was had, you know, one or, or, you know, two guys on Bennett at all times when he was on the ice and especially on the power play. Of course, Friday night was the only night that either team had a power play with Saturday. Uh, basically no penalties were called. Um, but yeah, you could tell Friday night um, they were really focusing in on him on the power play and Anytime he had the puck, really, and I think they did a really good job of shutting him down. I don't think he had a point this weekend on their four goals. Um, I meant to look, but I he mean, did not record any yeah. points this weekend. Um, I know he was on the ice for a couple of their goals, but still, you know, kind of shutting him down was was a key. Um, and of course, Simon Lacozzi just stood on his head the whole weekend, and um, without him on Saturday, that you know is probably a different story. Obviously a couple late goals at the end on Saturday kind of made it more interesting than it should have been. But, um, you know, he made some fantastic saves this weekend and one of them was a top five play, which was awesome, but he made so many plays on the, on the weekend, helping the breakout, um, and making some big saves and some key times to, uh, to lead us to the suite. Yeah. He was Friday. I just watching it from me not knowing anything about goaltending or angles or anything, but he just looked on top of his game, and that was peak Lacozzi. Like, mm -hmm. that's... He, I, I, as I was watching, I'm like, 
going to take a miracle to beat this kid right now. <laughs> like, it just was. Yeah, the last couple of series uh, have been, you know, up and down. Obviously, last Friday against St. Cloud, six goals against wasn't great. Um, and then I think getting the night off last Saturday was was good for him, having a little, uh, a little bit of a break and then coming back this weekend and refocusing. So um, a great weekend for him um, on the back end. And he had a lot of support in front of him, too. I know the defense uh, was able to uh, – you know, get some back checks on a couple of the breakaways or the two on one. So uh, a lot of help and man, it was fun to watch. Yeah, at least one of us enjoyed it. <laughs> and and honestly, Friday, the 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 major Friday early in the game and then the uh, shorthanded goal, I don't think it's been a long time since I've heard Baxter that loud. It was it was nice having we've we've been fortunate enough to have um, a lot of people come in to watch the games the last couple of seasons, and it's been it's been really nice. Um, and Friday night, I mean, it was super loud. It was some of the loudest I've ever heard that that building. So it's nice that we get some some fans that enjoy you know <laughs> this little market that we have um, getting loud and, and coming to watch the games. And I do think that that shorthanded goal on the major set the tone for the whole weekend it, it just really did um yeah it was it was a bad hit it was a major yeah but <laughs> i i walked upstairs after the first and my brother was up there and i go we got a five minute major and we're down one because of it like we had a five minute power play and we end up down one, negative one on that. Mm -hmm. It just set the tone for the whole rest of the weekend. And that yeah. it's but, weird how that works. Yeah, the the PK, I mean, it it wasn't anything special that, that Omaha did. I mean, Omaha's all season, the last couple of seasons have had a has had a really hard four check on the PK. And I they just must have done a little bit extra homework on uh on it this weekend because especially there was a couple breakouts that minnesota duluth had that i mean just did not barely got to the neutral zone and it was already you know back into the omaha o zone so it was uh it was nice the pk for us has been struggling a little bit this season um it's certainly not where it it has been in the past seasons um so getting that shorthanded goal i think I, we don't have many this season we're not really a shorthanded goal team but um yeah like you said it set the tone and then the early goal saturday as well 17 seconds in that just i mean uh barely barely even sat down and we're already up one nothing i think it set the tone and um it uh it, it was you know it was nice obviously working with with the lead that that early and um i know our record when scoring first is is very good and um it, it helped too. Obviously, we're now eleven and one and one goal games, uh, with uh, most of those being in regulation. I think eight of those eleven wins have been in regulation or in overtime. Um, so obviously, getting off to an early lead, hopefully building some momentum to not have an end in a one goal game, um, is great. But yeah, it was yeah. I think the other thing I was seeing too is that Duluth was extremely shallow as far as center went uh, as a position on the weekend. Uh, they were using some guys who did not necessarily play the position regularly. And I think that was, that was showing up in some crucial moments too. You know, the defensive draws, the, the offensive face off uh, on that power play um, areas where you want to get the puck right off, off the drop and, and sustain pressure and build and get those cycles going and they just couldn't even get off on the right foot on a, on a lot of the possessions and it it appeared quite regularly throughout both games but i know that was a, a point that was mentioned at least friday night on the cbs broadcast yeah and i think even um when we talked with bruce he was mentioning that too with injuries and and guys uh and then i don't know i can't remember if our one academically ineligible kid was uh was a centerman or not i'd I'd have to go back and look um but yeah 
it, it's been mentioned a few times, and that definitely hurts. It's like yeah, putting I mean, us, all three of us out at center. Yeah, Friday night was, you know, complete domination at one point. We were almost tripling up uh, in face-off wins, I think. And then, obviously, on the empty net goal Saturday night, uh, just a clean win, able to find some space and, and shoot it down the puck, uh, made a big difference. And I think, you know, uh, Omaha has been traditionally a very good face-off team, and, man, it, it helped this weekend for sure. I was just thinking, going back to what you said about, you know, your record when you get up first, I feel like that's the same thing with UMD. We need to get the first goal. But you guys are finding ways to win these one goal games when you score, or games when you score first at least and play with the lead. My Bulldogs, not so much. It, it's kind of like, um, it's just when you see a team through the first little portion of a season, you know, okay, we don't have a pa- have to panic. You know, the the Wild had that last year or something where it's they were they go down a goal and it's like oh they come back like not <laughs> worried about it. And other teams, you're like oh well, gave up the first goal. We're kind of screwed. And I think your Mavericks are a little bit in between where it's you score the first goal. Great. If you don't, okay, we, we can still come back, but either way, it's going to be a tight game. Yeah. As long as we can keep it close um, in most instances, if we don't get out to a huge lead, as long as we can keep it close, there's probably a good chance that we can, we can find our way back in it. Um, I know two weeks ago against Denver at home, we scored the first goal um, both nights and then just had disastrous second periods that put us behind the eight ball. I think Friday night was like within three minutes, the last three minutes of the second period, we let in three goals. And at that point, you know, against, against Denver, it's tough. And then Saturday night, the same thing happened, scored the first goal pretty early in the first. And then I think we went in tied and then, uh, you know, three goals again in the second period for Denver, and and there you go, there's your game. So, and then I think last weekend, both nights we allowed the first goal, um, and you know, kept at least those games kept it close, um, and and we were able to find four points out of it. So it was nice. It, it's you know, it's that's that's the the double edged sword right there. Is you know, you you get the first goal, and then you know, you got to keep up the pressure and. And if you go down, able to keep it close, um, hopefully find a way to, to at least get some points. I think Denver, their second period is their strongest period of the three, if I remember that being the, the statement that was made. Um, and Western has fallen into that trap a couple of times against a strong Denver team. Able to avoid it this weekend, though, they kept Denver scoreless in both second periods. Um Almost came back on them Friday night. We're able to get out in front and get a big lead on them Saturday night and wrapped up that one with a 7-2 win. Um, again, both entertaining games. It was This time, I mean, they're two of the highest-powered offenses in the country. And, I mean, in the conference for sure, but also in the country. Um, each one has a player with 21 goals now at this moment, uh, three of the five players tied for the nation lead in goal scoring are out of the NCHC. It just, there's so much offense in this, this conference that it really comes down to who's able to play the best defense on a weekend. And I, I really think the Western defense came and showed up a little bit more than it has in the past. And they actually got complimentary offense this week, which we don't always see. Uh, and that's something I think that if they can do consistently, they're a very dangerous team. And much like North Dakota, they got to avoid that overtime because they are winless in the o- extra time this year in all aspects. So really want to try and do what Denver does, get up early on teams, keep putting it in the net when they see it go in and, and hope to to run out the clock there. Uh, but just play smart defense and really rely on that transition game that they do so well 
um, even without necessarily an emphasis on defense, which I wish they would have more of. Yeah, it was uh, it was a little frustrating, obviously, going into this weekend, seeing Western kind of pour it on on Saturday uh, after losing three straight. But, I mean, you expect nothing less from from that team, from your, your Broncos. I mean, just you're kind of sick of losing, and you find a way to uh, to shut down nation's leading uh, scoring team. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to do that this season. Uh but it seems at least some teams are able to. So I mean, you got him in that wonky, delayed, postponed, two thirds played on a Sunday game. Yeah, well, until this weekend, it was that was the, <laughs> our only regulation win in NCHC. So I, it was kind of fluky. So it was nice yeah. getting at least one this weekend. Uh, but yeah, uh, it was. It's one one of the that, that was the game that like I kind of forget. It's like oh yeah, well, I've looking at the records like oh yeah we have one regulation win what what is it <laughs> oh yeah we beat denver yeah and that's great <laughs> uh the other thing that western did really well this weekend i don't know if you guys saw it but that saturday game they absolutely owned the faceoff circle i think through the first period by the end of the first period i think they were 23 oh, yeah. and 0 on the faceoff dot oh, um tim, tim washi got a penalty i think friday early friday for a face-off violation and took it personally because he did not lose very many uh, the rest <laughs> of the weekend. I think maybe he lost five in all of the Saturday game. Um, but yeah, you know, going from a team that did not put up too many wins in uh, Duluth to, to a Western team who I believe through the first period was had a clean sweep on face-offs. Um, so hopefully they can continue that trend because again, you know, Omaha did a pretty good job on the faceoff dot. Granted, it was a little bit of a lesser team there in Duluth with all the injuries they've suffered at the position, but they're there to be one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Washi went 15 of 21 on Saturday, uh, as a team, Western went 48 of 68. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I, so. I saw that, that stat come out on Twitter. Uh, well, we were at the game, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I said about Friday's Omaha-Duluth game, like, Omaha dominated the dot, and I'm not saying that's the reason why they won by so much, but it, you can certainly win a lot of a lot of games when you, you win a lot of face-offs, so. Well, and they they are important, and it, all, it also kind of depends. I know um, – Dean Evison would talk about it when he was the coach here. I haven't heard too much of John John Hines uh, for the Wild, but he'd be like, well, yeah, it's on the centermen, but it's also on the wingers. You got to get in there. If you're not winning it cleanly, the wingers got to get in there and try and do it. So it's not all on the centermen, but I mean, in all honesty, they're probably getting beat clean. 80% of the time in general, if you're not a centerman and you don't really know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but then I was also thinking of just about the scoring uh, with Omaha. You're going from, because you have Jack Devine, you have Ben Steves for the goal leaders, and then uh, Dylan Went. The difference between going from Steves to Went is... Western has a lot more around him that can actually score. And he's just the standout where we don't have much secondary scoring. So um, I think it's going to be a little tougher test for you guys because you can't just focus on one guy and be like, eh. Yeah, I mean, Colangelo is not too far off on him. He's sitting at 17 <laughs> goals on the season. Uh, the depth of scoring that Western has had the last three years is absolutely ridiculous because that's the storyline going in is, how are they going to replace that scoring from their their number one line last year? Well, they've done it the last three consecutive years. I mean, this is the third year where at this point in the year, we've got a player with at least a share of the nation's goal-scoring lead. Um, and it's not always one line that's doing it either. Like I said, you know, Colangelo, he's on that second. Generally, it seems like they're the second line. They've gotten some starts 
as the the first line here uh the last couple of weeks mixing it up a little bit but he's dangerous you know we've got shooters on the blue line who can sneak a puck in here and there um granger is a great setup guy but if you give him space he can bury a puck on a goaltender so it, there's a a lot of scoring that comes from this western team and it, it's no joke that you know they're right up there with teams i think at like four goals a game but but again it's it's spread out i think there were six goal scorers of the seven goals that were scored saturday um so definitely not just coming from all from one spot and it i think it does put some pressure on teams and, and you know they run two solid power play lines they're set up a little similarly i think if you kind of figure out how to stop one line you might be able to stop the other but i, I wish there was a little bit more difference between our two power play lines than there is this year both are capable of scoring so you don't want to be in the box too often i think at one point they were one of the the better ranked power plays i'm not sure if they still are but they were at one point and i know the pk was was ranked up there pretty high too so an all-around decent team um and they just need to be more complimentary of games and i think they could win some more games than they have and they've won quite a few yeah, i think that's that's a thing too i think same here with Omaha. Is I think we had eight different goal scorers for nine nine goals this last weekend, and um, Jack Randall just became the first double digit goal scorer of the season for us. So um, it's nice that we've had um, a lot more depth scoring. I just wish it was a little bit more. Um, certainly not scoring as many goals as we have in the past few seasons, but seeing that everyone's able to. Uh, contribute in a way um it has been really nice uh, that's certainly been uh, something for us too that depth has been a little weak the last few seasons and so getting um like you were saying like all four lines contributing especially this last weekend um and i mean everyone on the ice for us seems to um be able to score a goal in some capacity um and i think as you were saying saying that like traditionally um, I feel like Omaha and Duluth has been a really even matchup. I think the two teams have a really similar, similar play style, but I think this season size and, and depth of goal scoring with Western this year is, is, um, and it's been that way a couple for the last few seasons, but I think especially this year, um, yeah, I think it's been about the same. Obviously you guys have some guys that have scored more goals um, than others, you know, uh, like you were saying, like Colangelo has 21 or, or Wendt has 21 and Colangelo's not far behind with 17. You know, we don't have that guy who's really come out and, and stood out as the goal scorer. Um, but I think that's kind of just the Omaha way of, of everyone contributing and everyone getting on the score sheet um, and, and maybe not having that star player, but being able to kind of be unpredictable in a way of, of, of anyone on the ice could score a goal in some capacity. So. Yeah, you guys right now you have well, you have three in the top thirty for goals, uh, with Randy, uh, Mueller, and Ludke, and then Western has four, uh, and Ludke and Mueller are also tied with Ethan Phillips with eight, and then Granger has nine. Uh, and then Sam and went with 17 and 21. So it's that's a little more even versus. Oh, Biondi has eight. Oh, geez. I didn't even realize he had that many. I mean, we have two, but it's a little more evened out amongst the goal scorers. Uh, but yeah, that that third and fourth line they play a huge part in this conference a huge huge part because if you don't have that depth you're pretty much screwed yeah uh and then the other game other series on the weekend st cloud state traveled to colorado college uh they split the weekend i watched a bit of it i mean i had all the games on it just wasn't one that necessarily drew my eye to it close game friday night that one went to overtime uh, and then Colorado College had a 5-3 win on Saturday. 
Bassey playing his former team that he transferred from a couple years ago. Um, and Berko doing Berko things. I think he had one of the top plays once again. Um, he's a stellar goalie, one of the better ones in the conference for sure. But those two, uh, Colorado College has the week off this week. Denver has the week off this week. North Dakota and Duluth also not playing this weekend. Mm-hmm. North Dakota, Miami had some moments there. Miami led most of the game Friday, um, including having a two-goal lead 4-2 late into the third period. North Dakota able to tie it up and, and win it in overtime. Uh, I guess Person had a bit of a difficult trip back to Oxford. Not that I think anyone would expect anything less. Um, that was really kind of the standout, I think, was just that he seemed to struggle Friday night, found it again Saturday. And North Dakota comes away with six points, putting them firmly in first place of the NCHC standings, which we can go through real quick. Uh, North Dakota has a seven-point lead over St. Cloud State. St. Cloud State has an opportunity to narrow that gap this weekend with a couple, if they can pick up a couple wins over Miami. Uh, Colorado College, three points behind St. Cloud at 27. Denver, just a point behind them at 26. Western, one behind Denver at 25. Uh, Omaha right behind Western at 21, Minnesota Duluth right behind them at 20, and bringing up the caboose of the conference, Miami with a whopping six points. <laughs> Three of those earned with their one conference win over Western Michigan, which is just fantastic that they did that. Hey, don't, don't worry. We, we play Miami at Miami in a few weeks, so... <laughs> they'll still have six points by the time we play them, and they'll probably have a few more after after we leave. So uh, they do have two overtime losses as well to provide some points for them. Um, I think that wraps up the last weekend. We can dive into the two. Well, we kind of went over the couple series this weekend. You know, Western and, and Omaha. I think it's going to be a really good matchup. I'm kind of stuck on who I think is going to win what games. I, I think a split seems most logical. I, I I want Western to build on what they did Friday, Saturday night, and I want I think they're most likely to win Friday, but I've said that about every Friday home team, and 80% <laughs> of the time I think I've been wrong. There's some like I don't know, dude. The teams have traveled really well, and the Friday games have been as unpredictable as ever. Um, you know, you used to think, oh, the team that travels is going to have the issue Friday with the the legs from the bus or the the plane or whatever it may be, but that has not been the case this year. In fact, I think more away teams have won on Fridays than they have lost, and, and this weekend was was no different. You know. Omaha being Omaha, I mean, it was 50 50. North Dakota and St. Cloud State both won Friday games. Uh, I picked Duluth to win it. They lost in overtime and picked Denver to win, and they did. But the, the travel has not seemed to be as big of a deal as it once was. Perhaps, you know, players are just better trained, better prepared, used to travel. I mean, hell, they've been traveling since they were, what, seven? So. <laughs> I don't know that that's really an excuse anymore. Uh, and you've got to be prepared for that team to to be ready to walk into your building to play. So I think it's going to be a split. I just legitimately don't know who's going to win what games. I've I've written them both as winners on Friday and both as winners on Saturday. And my brain's just like, I don't know who gets it. <laughs> I don't. I, I would like to see, like I said, I would like to see Western build on what they did Friday or Saturday in Denver. And really even what they did Friday, because they did not play terribly Friday. Some unfortunate bounces, um, maybe some interesting penalty calls or, or what have you. But at the end of the day, you still got to produce it and, and play the game. So they had an opportunity to win both games. They didn't win Friday. They did Saturday. Omaha coming kind of off of a similar... weekend but 
they they got the the sweep, and I think they can continue a little bit off of what they were able to do. Um, I know the the you know the the atmosphere at the event is going to be great. It always is. Um, I want to be wrong, but I'm going to give Omaha the win Friday. I'm going to lock it in that Omaha gets the win Friday, and Western's going to bounce back and get the win Saturday. Kind of the opposite of what they did earlier this season down there at Baxter Arena. But I want to be wrong, and I want Western to sweep. So, as a fan, I want the sweep. As as someone who's trying to potentially use my brain and think of what could happen, a split seems realistic and logical. But I fandom and logic are often at odds. W not S. Um, I think it's going to be a split too, but I do think they're going to be really close games. And I know it's it's something that everybody says, but it's going to come down to special teams. And I just pulled up the stats here um, as of yesterday. And on the PK, Western is 18th at 83.7%. And Omaha is all the way down at 43rd in 77.9%. And in the power play, I'll get the ranking, but Western's just about at a 25% clip. Um, you're 13th. And Omaha is tied for 47th with Bemidji State at 15.8%. Uh, so I five on five, I think this is really close, but... Obviously, Western has the more deadly power play with how they've been scoring. <sighs> Surprisingly, our power play has struggled a little bit the last couple of weeks, and it has been our five-on-five -five game that has really carried us. Yeah, we're actually ranked ahead of you uh, in power play percentage. We're, we are ranked third in the nation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, some five-on-threes will help that. Yeah. <laughs> Drawing some major penalties. Five, that five on three majors. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Agree or disagree with the calls, I don't know. But I'm just saying, if you're five on three for about four minutes and 42 seconds, there's possibilities only, that a goal is going to get scored. Yeah, you only scored once. Suck it, nerd. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'm like... And you didn't, you didn't get any on the second five on three when one of them was a major penalty the next night either. So eat it. Yeah, I, I, I know. I don't know what, uh, what you were offering those referees, but stop it. I wasn't offering them anything. I wasn't even anywhere near the arena. Uh huh. And I love my team, but I don't love them that much. It just makes it seem less conspicuous, but I know what you were doing. Uh. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm I'm kind of the same with US. Like I don't know which team is gonna win which game. Just for the heck of it, I'm gonna go opposite of you. I'm gonna go Western on Friday and Omaha on Saturday. I just feel like this is gonna be such a close series. Yeah, right. for sure. Up to you, Brent. Now you gotta break the tie <laughs> here. Uh yeah, I mean it it's it should be um it should be really good. I I'm interested to see obviously this is uh some of the freshmen's first first trip to Lawson. Um you know, the same thing I was I was worried with um uh, the same issue with going to the Ralph up in North Dakota and just uh how the team would get the youngsters ready for the environment. I think we've got a good senior core to get them ready to kind of just let them know to block it out. Um, but obviously Lawson is, has always been a, a very, very tough barn to play in. Um, as long as you don't look at the weekend that CC came to visit. Um, but I, I think it, it should be a really good, a really good weekend of, of hockey. Um, I think Omaha wins on Friday. Um, I, I'll probably go with Wes. I think Omaha wins on Friday. Um, I don't want any bonus points, but I'm it will probably be in overtime. But I think they went on Friday. Um, Saturday, 
Uh, it'll probably be a loss for Omaha. I think Western takes it on Saturday. But, um, I mean, it should be good. Anything we get, I, I, I just want us to get some points, um, kind of try to build off of last weekend build a little bit of a barrier since we're off next weekend um, so that uh, if Duluth does make up some points next weekend, it's not too much. And we can, we can try to stay in that, you know, close fifth, sixth range um, heading into a couple weekends from now when we're all back in action. So it should be good. I mean, I, I won't be, a, I will be upset if we get completely swept and don't take any points, but it's a good team. So um, this is this is the kind of hockey we want to be playing at, the, at this point in the season. So, um, uh, one thing that I I liked hearing, uh, I just rewatched the beginning of Friday's uh, game on CBS Sports Network, and like Dave Starman said, I mean the the teams that do the best and and the playoffs, the teams that are coming off of really good ends of the regular season, I think that kind of starts now, and I'm hoping um, that these last two weekends haven't just been um, you know, getting lucky. I think, I think it's it's kind of a the start to the build up to the postseason. So, and I think um, one of the things, like, I think the reason I have Western winning is kind of something you alluded to is them getting the seniors getting them ready to play at North Dakota. Just watching the games on TV. Yeah, the Ralph, it's a big atmosphere. They're nuts about their hockey and everything. But Lawson is a completely different animal because the student section is right there. They oh, yeah. are they're, right in the penalty box and they're right like, around the penalty box. Right. They are all the way down the ice. Like there is not that <laughs> reprieve of like if I'm in the offensive zone, I'm away from the student section. No, they're on you the entire length of the ice. Like, there's not a quiet spot. Like, oh, the second period, our goalie's not directly in front of the student section. Want to bet? Because that's when the other half of the students get to have fun for two for a third of the game. Otherwise, you're you're stuck by the the one the band and the one group of students. Like, there is not a f a break in that building if you're an away team and that student section is juiced to the gills like they often are. And then to make alcohol legal in that building is just, boy, oh boy, that is a section to be in. But. See that, and that's one of the things. Um, first time I saw Lawson on TV, I was like, "Holy crap!" And I think I was, I was up hunting, and I told my parents, I was like, "You gotta come look at this, like." That whole side is just the students. And it's, like Wes said, it, it's like college football. You know, you have the student section in one end, and then us normal folk, adults on the other, <laughs> and families and whatever. Was it last weekend, Wes, that I was like, I haven't seen Lawson this amped up in a little while. Like, they weren't that up amped up for umd but i think it was the cc series because was that the one that you ended up in the student section yeah yeah that, that was the alumni weekend so they had all the yeah. some of the former guys back in town it was a big deal um holy crap you know unfortunate <laughs> to lose two overtime games on that weekend it's just whatever but fine you got At the no same time <laughs> It it was just like I'm watching this, dude. That Friday is so that, jacked. That Friday game is probably one of the most frustrating losses I have seen in my time as a Western fan. I was less irritated at the Saturday game than I was the Friday game. I was not over the Friday game until like two o'clock Saturday afternoon. Just the way that game ended, and nobody did anything. I mean, the coach was a hundred percent right in post conference we had our three best players out there and we absolutely embarrassed ourselves in three on three hockey you can't have it um saturday you know a little bit more at least we made it an effort in overtime but there's still some improvement that needs to take place in overtime games we need to get that figured out if if luckily i guess 
you know, conference play in the playoffs and the, and the tournament does not end three on three over time. So we got that going for us, right? Uh, <laughs> still mad about that weekend. Um, <laughs> no, they bounced back great against Denver. You know, four straight losses is not fun at any point in the season, but we could turn that around and rip off four straight wins just as easy. So really what we need as Western fans is Miami to do something spectacular and sweep (laughs) St. Cloud State. Because if Western can sweep Nebraska Omaha and Miami can sweep St. Cloud State, Western has a chance to jump from that fifth spot straight up to number two. Uh, with a, with a sweep of the weekend, so still lots up for grabs. You know, we saw a lot of shifting and rearranging of the standings this weekend. Um, there won't be as much coming out just because it, again, it's just two series. But that being said, I don't believe Miami is going to do that and be helpful to such a degree. In fact, I <laughs> believe they will be swept by Saint Cloud State, much like they were North Dakota. Um, but that being said, I believe of their three wins last year, I think one of them was a straight up win over St. Cloud State last year. So stranger things have happened. I do. I think you're right. I think one of their. I know they beat us. And I want to say, I want to say they like shellacked St. Cloud State last weekend. Like it was like a eight to one something stupid. It should not have happened in the course of human history. Kind of win. <laughs> That they had over St. Cloud State last year. In fact, Saint I'm going to go had one of those typically bad. Also, I'm. I'm. Who, do you have a number four, Brent, on your roster? Because I'm trying to pull it up, but my internet's being slow. This year, no. Uh, Kirby Proctor's number three. Um, and then Zach Erdahl is number six. Okay, so that'll so, probably be number three then. He will yeah. be the designated player who will be harassed the entire weekend. Yeah. Is my guess. Is he, I don't really is he have at any. least experienced. At, he's at least a fifth, he, he's okay. a fifth year senior. Okay. Okay, so then he's used to it. They, yeah. they got Miami <laughs> Miami shut out St. Cloud five zero last year in Oxford, Ohio. I think I, I remember us talking about it. We're like And they had a six two win over Omaha in Omaha. They're, they're always guaranteed like I hate playing Miami and it's just like CC in Miami I'm not looking forward like it's right at the end of the season too like we've got a really good western team to play in this weekend and then we get an off week that's gonna get us really prepared oh, wait, no, and we're, gonna, we're gonna welcome CC and not gonna do well although CC this year those would be bad losses Think Cloud that had that win over Omaha. And then we got to go to Oxford the weekend afterwards, and we're not going to do well, and it's just going to kill our momentum. And then we're going to have to welcome North Dakota to end the season, and it's just going to be awful. And that's like part of the reason that the last few seasons haven't gone our way is because we always get CC and or Miami at the end of the season, and then obviously we get North Dakota at the end of the season, and it's just always tough. And obviously, yeah, the good teams win. And whatever, I'm just complaining. I hate playing North Dakota at the end of the season, even though it should help us. Uh, well, Except you know, last season, this, this, we played them five straight times. This might be well. If you want to talk about playing a team straight times, you should just ask Mike about playing Saint Cloud State. This I might think, well. That's true. I think it's happened to us three of the of the eleven uh, years. I think it's happened to us three times because I know there was one year we had to play Denver. Um, on the road, come home, and then go out to Denver again for the postseason. And then I think two times, um, one of those, one of the years, um, we had to, or, or two times, it was against North Dakota. We had to go um, to North Dakota, and I think we had a. It was, it was one year. I think we had a chance. Um, I don't even know where I'll be going with that. But I think we had to play at North Dakota to end the season, and then they came to Omaha that season for uh, the quarterfinals. That wasn't fun. And then obviously last season we finished on the road at North Dakota. I think, yeah. And then they came to Omaha, and I hate it. (laughs) 
I'm think. just an Omaha, Omaha fan complaining about playing North Dakota because obviously, obviously. Yeah. The, the past two seasons, we have played St. Cloud State 13 times. Yeah. 13. Yeah. And it, it it's been – I don't know what they did – last year because I I believe if it's the alternating schedule two years ago well one of the two years it was they played St. Cloud State to end the year and then they played them in the playoffs and I went to that one two years ago and then last year I don't remember where it was but play St. Cloud State there and then play them three more times because it went to the third game, and it was like, dear God, can we, like, get rid of these Huskies? Like, I love dogs, but not the Husky right now. They were really fun games and, and a fun atmosphere. Um, well, the women... Actually, the first time I saw Western play was um, about eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. They played up in St. Cloud for the first round of the NCHC playoffs, and I was like, eh. St. Cloud's an hour away. Might as well go watch some playoff hockey. And it was spring break, so it was kind of dead, but it was still fun. Yeah. Yeah, the winner of the St. Cloud uh, Duluth series has won the Frozen Faceoff the last two years in a row, though. So, and coming out of that four or five matchup where Western is cl- sitting right now. Um, so, Brent, I'm guessing you're also. Picking Miami to get swept. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, by some miracle, they. I mean, maybe. Yeah, probably. Yeah, they're gonna get swept. I was just thinking about that though. Right now, Omaha would be going to Colorado Springs if the season ended. That's crazy. Mm, yep. Man. And son of a, guess where we'd be going. <laughs> You would be going to St. Cloud. <laughs> At least it's a two seven matchup, not the not the four five. <laughs> we we're stuck in that freaking three six matchup and I hate it. I swear to God though. Obviously obviously none of none of the matchups have been good to us. I mean the three six four five or the six or the two seven. Like it doesn't matter where we end up or it's gonna be tough for us, but like <laughs> It would be really funny, though, if UMD and St. Cloud played each other again and one of those teams won the Frozen Faceoff again for the third yeah, imagine, year. Yeah, imagine we get the, like, same matchups as, you know, a previous year, but at this year, like, obviously, like, Omaha and CC would have been, obviously never played in this, the quarterfinal against each other because they're always at the bottom next to each other, but that would be, I mean... CC never hosted, has never hosted a quarterfinal, so that would be fun to ruin their parade, possibly. Yeah, that'd be cool. Let's go to CC and ruin their happy times. Omaha makes their first frozen face-off the same season CC hosts their first quarterfinal. Greatly appreciate that, because Colorado College has pooped on my parade twice, (laughs) and we have been the home seed for those very fine young gentlemen who play hockey extremely well. In the playoffs <laughs> at Lawson. I hate playing at Lawson because yeah. historically it has not been good in the postseason, obviously. And what was it? A couple years ago, um, game two, I was de- I was just watching the TV and I had uh, the other games on my laptop. And the second I turned to look at some other game that was like under review, uh, I looked back up and the game was over in overtime. I was like, "Oh, our season just ended." <laughs> I was like, "Great, I missed it. I missed. It. I watched all season. I missed <laughs> the end of very." <laughs> oh, I mean, probably saved you a little bit of pain. Just a <laughs> yeah, <little> exactly. <laughs> all right, that covers that last weekend. That covers this weekend. Let's talk about some weekly awards, I suppose. There were five players of the week this week. Forward Jackson Blake for North Dakota. Uh, Co-defenseman of the week, Logan Britt of North Dakota and Kirby Proctor for Omaha. The rookie of the week goes to Minnesota Duluth's Matthew Perkins. 
Goaltender of the week. Slightly questionable in my opinion. Goes to Dominic Bassi of St. Cloud State. As there were two goaltenders that had sweeps on the weekend. And I believe would have been more deserving of the title. Uh, one, clearly more so than the other even. I believe Cozy got robbed on this one. All because one goaltender made 70 saves on the weekend. But also gave up five goals. Uh, oh, yeah. And and guess what? He lost a game. I don't care if you stop 70 pucks. If you lose the game. A game. <laughs> uh, Brent, I don't know how you feel about this, but over the last couple of years, Wes and I, we've had a gripe with the goaltender of the week. Um, because a goalie will get a shutout, and then, you know, maybe no other goalie gets a shutout, but that goalie that had the shutout lost the next game. Uh, they just give them the award. Oh, well, you got a shutout. Are, are you really looking at what they did? Are you watching the games, or are you just looking at the box scores? I don't know if you have a gripe with some of these awards or not, or or especially the, the goaltender one is probably the easiest one to pick out just because there's only one per team per weekend yeah, usually Wes and I were talking today on on Twitter about it <clears throat> I know there was I think earlier this season um like let cozy played one game and got a shutout or something um and then Omaha went on to lose Saturday or whatever but let cozy because of his shutout, got goaltender of the week despite only playing one game, uh, you know, and and you know other other goaltenders playing two and also playing, you know, maybe only giving up one goal. Like it, it's. I feel like it's strictly stats driven, and it's not really spotlighting maybe the the best of the weekend. Um, like I was telling West too, like I feel like maybe they just look at a couple of the teams and it's like, okay, well this guy's been hot and he's still hot, so might as well just make him uh, whatever of the week. Um, and with the co-defensemen this week, I also noticed there were no other nominees for that, so they probably just had two nominees and were like, ah, we'll just give it to both of them. Um, not to say that they're not both. I mean, Kirby had a four-point weekend. As a defenseman, that's especially for us. That's been that's really good. I'll, I'll take it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's I don't I, like I told Wes too. Like us in Omaha, we don't really expect much recognition from the NCHC. It's just we just haven't been shown the same, in our opinion, or maybe just in my opinion. But you know, they're, Tanner Ludke probably should be all rookie team first team this year may i mean probably not rookie of the year but he certainly had a great year and i i really hope to see that he gets some recognition for that i'm sure he will but it's just one of those things like he should but he might not and that's just something that we've we've lived with well um here's what we've learned about some of the awards we know they favor in conference play over non conference play uh, we know they don't necessarily look at strength of opponent in all aspects or forms. Um, you know, if you're a defenseman, the lean is towards offensive production, which sometimes I don't know if that's necessarily the best way to determine a defenseman. Uh, I mean, the NHL does that. So. Yeah. It again, that it's. <laughs> An issue for all defensive awards, though, but I think that means trying to understand the nuance of the game a little more than the flashy stats that appear on a stat sheet uh, that everybody knows. Everybody knows a goal and an assist. Not everyone's willing to sit there and count block shots, um, you know, or or takeaways or turnovers to, to really understand the play of a defenseman. So that's that's the thing too, is especially the way that NCHC does individual tweets for everything you know is they only have one clip yeah. for each player a week so if that one clip is a block shot 
or whatever, you know, he had 10 block shots. Well, here's one of them and that's it. And so if it's, if he scored two goals and, and whatever, you're obviously going to want to have a player that it has something flashy to show off. So I think what you were saying is, especially when it comes to the defensemen, it, it's more points driven, more offensive defensemen is, you know, what they should just name it, the offensive defenseman of the week. Yeah. But I know there have been those off times where it's like, this guy scored a goal, but he also, the the power play or the penalty kill went five for five on the weekend. Um, so I know that also has a little bit um, of uh, like validity or whatever to it, you know. Um, I, I was just looking out of the the two goalies that had uh, that had a sweep this weekend. Guess which one didn't go to overtime? Yeah, no, I I think Lacozzi I mean, should have yeah, been the, the clear in a way the winner of the goalie of the week award. Uh, he was more consistent throughout the weekend. Uh, Friday night, he he allowed one goal on 24 shots. He had a nine, five save percentage Saturday. He goes 36 of 39 with a nine, two, three save percentage, you know, nine, three, uh, nine, three, six on the weekend, 59 of 63 only gave up four goals on the weekend. So it goes against average of two uh, Bassey Friday night. Yes. He goes four. Uh, 44 of 45 for a 97 save percentage. Saturday not as great, you know, uh, 26 of 30 for an 86 save percentage in a in a loss. Um, five total goals given up, so two and a half goals against average. 933 save percentage on the weekend, but the split. Um, and then uh, person, you know, he he could have been up there too, but to me. He gave up four goals in the first game. His team trailed most of the game. The offense got it back and, fo- and got it to overtime. He shows up in overtime to, to steal the win, but he's still 27 of 31 for an 8-7 save percentage. Uh, Saturday goes 33 th- for 34 against his former team with a 9-7 save percentage. And uh, he's up five total goals on the weekend, 9-2-3 save. Earns the sweep. But again, I think that Friday game he did not do as much to help his team, which is why I would put like cozy over him and the overtime loss is a little bit more diminished than the straight reg win that, or the, the overtime win counts less than the regulation win for let cozy to me. Um, and, but. and also you just look at let cozy on Friday. He like, you have to look at how many power plays the, or penalty kills, I guess, would be that the team has too, because, well, who's your best penalty killer? Your goalie. Yeah, he and had to kill, off kill off a major. major. Granted, he had some help and got a shorthanded goal on that, which made it a little bit easier. But, but I mean, it doesn't matter. You still, you know, you can score a shorthanded goal thirty seconds in. You still have okay. to kill off four minutes and thirty seconds of yeah. that that penalty. So, yeah, that's helpful. But at the same time. He's still got to kill off the rest of that penalty and not give up a goal, and he didn't. No, and, and I think you and I have made it obvious how we view the goaltenders. Like, if the number one thing should be, did you do you have a loss on your record? If you don't, that puts you already in one category. If you sweep the weekend, you're in one category by yourself. The second there's an L there, you're not up for the award in my in my regard. If there's a sweep there. Now, if there's two guys who have a sweep, did anybody, did one of them get a shutout? If you did, okay, you're, you got a point ahead. Did the other guy have a shutout? No, he didn't. But he got two wins on the weekend. Now we can look at those a little bit closer and go, okay, this guy's got a point for the shutout. What did this guy do? Oh, his team had seven penalties that didn't allow a goal on the, on during any of those power plays. Maybe they're a little closer in statistics. How many goals did they give up on the weekend? Oh, this guy gave up six goals on the entire weekend. The first game was a seven, five win and game two was a two Oh shutout. You know, there, there's a shutout, but he also gave up five. Whereas the other guy only gave up two per game and both games were four two wins. Like then it gets a little bit closer and where you're playing around with stuff. But I think when you, you're already looking at guys who have wins or losses, even if it's a, a close loss or a tough loss or an overtime loss, it still does not. The guy with two wins still ranks higher to me. Um, that's, you're showing you're at least showing up at the right times of, of games. 
maybe it's a last minute thing. And like I said, you know, it comes down to that over that overtime win does not count to me as high as the regulation win that like cozy had Friday. If we're just looking at Friday games, because you put yourself in a position where your team was down and your offense is the one that showed up and came in and you settled yourself down, but you were down for a majority of the game and it was at 1.2 goals down. I do think though that, um, these awards, I mean, they're the people work for the conference that do the social media, but they're not necessarily hockey fans as, as hardcore as we are, um, that pay attention to this stuff. So they just kind of look at this and they're given a task and they're like, eh, okay, this sounds good. And I mean, yeah, they're kind of nice to have, but at the same time, I also don't think that the players really give a rats about it. Um, they're out there to win games. Like, it's kind of nice, like, hey, you know, your athlete of the week in your high school paper or whatever, like, they're just kind of like, okay, I, you're a basketball player, you scored 63 points. You're athlete of the week. Do we win the game? No. Well, then I'm not, I, I really don't care. Like, I think they would rather have, especially at this level, they would rather have like an All American award or, you know, the Penrose Cup or the Frozen Face Off Championship, the Frozen Four Champ, like the National Championship. They were more worried about that. And this is just something that, um, gives us kind of like the national media gives us something to argue about and debate. Uh, it's still irritating though, when it's like, why do you even work for this, this league? If you don't care, I think that's what irritates me more where it's like, we know what we're talking about and they just hire these kids fresh out of college. And yeah, I mean, they need jobs too. I've been through it, but come on. Don't don't apply for a hockey conference if you don't care or know anything about the game. I think that's the thing too is we don't know who is necessarily um, doing it. You know, is it, is it something that comes from the coaches? Is it the the media teams? Is it the the SIDS? I, I doubt it's them. They have much more important things to do than than that. Um, you know. Just, most of their work goes ignored. Like, I don't know, learning players' names would be something that a SID could help a, a, a broadcaster out with if they only took the time to care. Um, not bitter about anything that happened this weekend in, in that regard. Um, yeah, not wait, knowing wait. I, I exactly who one. it is. Don't worry about it. No, I, no, 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 you've opened up. <laughs> Just go, just go just go watch the last i don't know five minutes of the denver western game and tell me if any name uh pops up that you have never heard of in regards <laughs> to a western player this year and yet was somehow called that name for i don't know say four straight minutes by one particular voice on the announce team yeah um, just watch that just watch the highlights to friday night's game and right, friday night i was gonna say not directly corrected by the other guy on the on the call, but ignored enough to refer to the exact same person by their actual name. So I don't. It's irritating. It's so irritating when players' names are mispronounced. I know. I I was watching Friday night after we got home, or after the game. Uh, I was watching the highlights of all the other games. Uh, to catch up on it and I caught it and I was like wait that that's not that's not his name mm -mm. that's not oh you're still calling him that name that's mm -mm. not his name mm -mm. And he's, that's that's he that. still calls him that name after the other guy on the announce crew pronounces <laughs> the right name and then he immediately goes the other guy go, immediately goes back to the wrong name You know, oh, it was these dudes are paid thousands of dollars. I last weekend again watching the St. Cloud broadcast. Oh my goodness! I every time they would say one of our guys' names wrong, 
we would correct him, and it was all game both nights. And it was so annoying. It's like there is there is a pronunciation guide at the bottom of the lineup I know mm-hmm. is in front of Just take a look at it during one commercial break. Yeah. One commercial break. Take two seconds and make sure you're saying that name right. And, and, you know, there, there's, there's, there's going to be people out there who's like, oh, well, it's hard to call a hockey game and it moves so fast. Cool. You only have to learn one set of names. You know the other set of names. If you don't know your own team that you're calling at this point in the season, like, and everything's in front of you, you have, you might even have a dude who gets the point at stuff. And you're like, oh, that guy's got the puck right there, and he's just moving along his finger on your little note board. Like, it doesn't I, I it, mean, it doesn't take that much work to, to figure out. My my dad did broadcasting for many many years, and I remember, um, he do all sports and everything, and he coached a bunch, but. I remember him going through rosters when he didn't know the teams and the night before the game going through and then he would go to the coach of the opposing team and say, how do you pronounce this name? How do you pronounce that name? And he would write it down to make sure he had it right. Yeah. And to me, that that's what bugs me the most. It's like you have media time with these coaches it's, it, this could be the only time that they're ever on tv it could be a kid that's this is his first game ever played and it could be his last at least get his name right the other thing the other thing this was a high profile player yeah <laughs> yeah this was not a fourth line dude who was called in because somebody got injured this was a name that pretty much everybody in the college hockey world knew going into this summer and made a splash by coming to Western. Yeah, and it's not a lot cozy. It's not. It. It's not even it's washy, simple. which sometimes gets <laughs> mispronounced as wash. No, this was an Alex Bump. Alex Bump was referred to as Kemp for like four straight fucking minutes. <laughs> and I don't know if this dude had like some other team on his brain. Because this isn't even a situation like it was in St. Cloud where you had. <laughs> Brandon Bussy on the ice, Dominic Bassey on the ice, and uh, the Brandon or Brendan Bushy on the ice yeah, all at the same fucking that, time. That, and this dude couldn't figure fun. out which one of them was touching the puck at any given moment. Because, yeah, sucks to be you tonight this weekend. Yeah, that that was like Omaha St. Cloud where we had Griffin and Tanner Ludke, and they have uh, a Lidke. And that was a, a common thing that we had to, you know, in our own our own house correct him and be like, nope, it's wrong. Nope, you're yeah. saying it wrong. You're still saying it wrong. It's still wrong. Yeah. It's exactly how it's spelled. Well, then there was, exactly there was what the, it's spelled. Uh, Tyler Clevin and Kyler – wait, what was the other one? There's, like, two Tyler Clevins, and then there was another kid who, like, at Denver who was similar enough to – and it was like, Jesus Christ with these names. Like, I get if they're similar names – no one knows who the hell Kemp is. Like I even went and looked at like Omaha's roster. I was like, oh, maybe this dude's still stuck on last weekend when they were playing Omaha. Nope. They don't have anybody named Kemp. We've never had a player named Kemp. Yeah. Well, as soon as I noticed it, I was like, wait a second. Does, does Western have a guy on their team named Kemp? And I went and looked. I was like, nope. He is, he is saying that Alex Bump is Alex Kemp. I'm, and, I'm just and literally to the out. other guy on the call just completely ignores it and go, oh, I bump with the puck now in the slot and shoots off the rebound. Like, can you like fix fi- fix your homeboy? Like, just be like, Ted, the, the kid's name is Bump, dude. It's on the back of his jersey. Can you figure it the fuck out? We're we're like, fifty five minutes into the game, my guy. And it's like the B I. Bees and K's yeah, do not even can, look remotely close. I mean, if you take off the top half of and bottom half of the B, you could. But the, a U but and an the, E? Yeah, the U and the E. I mean, that's the more egregious one to me. He if anything, fucked up 50% of the letters. <laughs> four know, letters. It's a four-letter. Four four letter. I mean, <laughs> granted... I go by a three letter name and, and people still want to add an extra one to the end of it. Like, I don't, I don't, it, it boggles my mind. Like, did, I, did you, I did not say a T when I said my name is Wes. I don't know where you're getting the T from. I even have a little bit of a whistle on my S so you know that that some bitch does not end on a T. If I said West, 
you would know because it goes at the end of it. I went, Wes. See how it kind of whistles? It goes at the end of it. Oh, I, I oh, we're not even gonna play last names because my last name does not help anybody learn how to pronounce things. But dude, four letters, <laughs> and you missed half of them for like five minutes. And that's the thing too. We like we we have brought it up um, with the commissioner about broadcasting, and oh, we're looking and we're trying to get the best we can. I'm like, and are this- you though? And and this wasn't even the like the backup radio clue. This this wasn't even the backup radio crew. This was the number one TV crew. <laughs> like, I hate you. I hate them so much. Well, and even with the St. Cloud, you know, we Wes and I have our own issues with them too. I think I do think Jim Rich, the play by play guy, does a decent job for for the most part i mean he's he's a professional he's done it for a long time he's still gonna screw it up the color commentator gino parish he could not figure out that the net on one end isn't drilled down far enough and we were playing there and he kept blaming i I don't remember if it was space guard or tyson but he kept blaming him every time he knocked it. He's like, the dude well, he blames, keeps knocking it off. He blames every away goalie that plays for, there for, for bumping for, the net. Like, your net sucks, dude. Even your own goalie is bumping the net every second period. Yeah, it, it was the second period. And, like, Caster or Bassey, either one, they were just – they'd move and they'd push it off, and he'd be like, oh, looks like the net's loose. And then third period comes – He's obviously doing it on purpose. I know your brother is a recovering alcoholic, but did you have like five drinks between periods? Like what? In Yeah. I mean, are, we, are you bipolar? Like it, it's, I don't know. It, the, the thing. There's something to complain about for every broadcast for sure. Without a doubt. And part of that and, is because. They're all independently run. There's no continuity between any of them. Uh, it's up to the, the school and who their local broadcast partners are uh, to figure it out. And some places don't spend, some cities don't spend the same amount of money to get the broadcast right. Some schools don't put in the same amount of effort to broadcast their games. And we pay a pretty penny for NCHC to watch our teams on the road. Uh, because it's significantly less than traveling to all these places to try and watch them play every weekend. But at some point, like you, there's, there, I'm not saying everybody has to be Alex and Dave. Okay. I, I'm not, I'm, we know that is the pinnacle because it has the most money behind it. It is CBS sports network. They're still using half the equipment that the schools provide them anyway. But those dudes take the time to learn the players, to learn a little bit about the players, to learn about the program. Like, granted, they're only calling, what, 10 games a year at this point? See, it's kind of funny because last night I was scrolling through YouTube TV and um, there was, or whatever night it was, it was South Dakota and South Dakota State basketball. Guess who's doing the play-by-play? Alex, because it's Midco Sports, yeah. No, this was CBS Sports Network. Oh, okay. But, I mean, he, oh. he also does Midco Sports, so I'm sure he does more than yeah. just um, North Dakota hockey. But I'm just saying, like, yeah. as as the, the production of the CBS Sports programming, like they're not engaged in all of the hockey all the time, which might yeah. actually make it harder because they're not looking at the roster week in and week out, and they have to literally learn two rosters over the course of five days plus travel – they interview the coaches, interview players, like whatever they have to do, like just take some amount of pride in your job. That, that's all I'm asking for. Like, well, and that's that's kind of what I'm saying too. Is they he takes pride in it because you know he did the our our game on Friday, and then whether it was Saturday or whatever day it was, he's doing that, and he took pride. He knew the each roster for South Dakota and South Dakota state for the basketball game because he cares. Yeah. And here are 
colored commentator for UMD is telling us everyone that he wants his kids to take penalties at the end of games because it's fun. That was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that, he is literally like, dude, it hurts my head how stupid those two comments were. The, getting the kid's name wrong for five minutes when, again, it's not like, like I would understand if it was, you know, like uh, Napier who played in the Saturday game for Western because a uh, defenseman was injured and it was our second defenseman injured. Like we had two new defensemen in there that haven't played much this year. Okay, that's not a name that you're kind of expecting to see. But again, this was a premier name that at some point was probably recruited by most of the schools in the country and had a big story come out that he was leaving his first choice of Vermont and was reopening his recruitment right at the end of the summer. And again, once again, everybody was probably drawn for him and he ends up in your conference at Western. Like. But yeah, I just think overall, there's a lack of. I don't even. There is a lack of professionalism. Like we don't get paid to do the crap we do on Twitter. We don't get paid to do this podcast. And yet, I put just as much effort into this, even though it may not seem like it some nights, I put just as much effort into this as I do my 40 hour a week job, or at the very least, my six hour a week job, checking IDs, kicking underage kids out of a bar. Like I go through and I look at, all right, who are the top players on the teams? You know, who are the, the guys aside from Western players who are sitting at the top of the list for goals for, you know, it's, it's Jack Devine, it's Ben Steves, it's Dylan Went or the, or the three from the NCHC. You know, Colangelo has 17 goals. I think uh, Granger is near the top in points because of the number of assists he has. You know, who's uh, starting? You know, Isaiah Seville was most recently called up a couple months ago to be with Las Vegas Golden Knights. You know, he doesn't even play for Western. He played for Omaha, and I know that he was called up by the Vegas Golden Knights. You know, uh, I mean, Getzel is constantly in the com- or NHL news for something. That dude played at Omaha. like Played his 500th game tonight. Yeah. You know, he has, what, two cups, I think. Like, he's probably one of the biggest names to come out of the conference, let alone the school he came out of. Brock Besser is killing it with Vancouver out of North Dakota. Like, yeah, we go above and beyond uh, just our own university and like re- try to represent the university in a positive way. And we're just idiots sitting in our basements or in our closets or wherever. I'm we... not in my closet. That, and, that oh, you, fi- like... you finally came out of the closet. Is that what you're saying, Mike? Got it. Good to know. <laughs> but like, that's the point. It's like we're, we're dipshits who have no better opinion than anybody else. We just happen to put them on the Internet. But we still take the time to realize that the dude's name is Bump and not Kemp. All right. <laughs> like to know, it, to know to know that we know oh. that the kind of respect that these guys want and that you know they kind of expect and then it just comes down to that it's just like we res- we respect that if yeah you might only see these guys once a year on on the road uh like omaha might only go to st cloud this one time on the road or you know this season but those two games, the the fan, the Omaha fans are going to be listening and watching you announce those names for two nights. Yeah. And would we just expect you to have the respect to learn their names and say it right for 120 minutes of the weekend. And that's that's all. That's all we want is for our names, any of the teams, to be cr- announced correctly or pretty correct. Yeah. I'll take pretty close. But like that that's just what it comes down to is is, is respecting uh the the visiting fans and the visiting players and everything. Like that's all it comes down to. And if you don't take that time, then it's like, okay, well you don't respect us or you don't you don't take the time just to, to do a little bit of research or get to know these guys and, and the team and whatever. And I think uh the thing with Alex, um and especially Dave, they've got so much experience now that they kinda know that, hey, if we take let's get to know these guys for, you know, half an hour and, and use our time wisely. Then we're going to make the broadcast a whole lot more fun to watch, especially 
God forbid you get an 8-1 game or a 7-2 game yeah. and you have to come up with something to talk about. Oh, hey, I talked to whatever this guy's name is. And, you know, he told me X and Y story and that was, was really cool. And, like, it, it's just those little bits of detail that that shows, hey, we kind of care about what we do. And here's a fun little tidbit that you wouldn't normally know if, if you know, we didn't take the time to learn about it. And I think that's what – that was what was cool about even just – talking with Bruce is um, Bruce Siski. He's he's the local radio announcer. Like, I mean, he's like any home radio announcer. He's got his opinions on things. But at the same time, he will go sit down with the head coach. He will go of the opposing team. He will go, you know, maybe talk to a player or two. He will actually put the time in. So, we are losing. If there is something, he can throw different things in there. And he does his research on all the stat. Well, I mean, I'm sure he has some help, but he typically just broadcasts by himself. Um, so I, I respect that a lot from him. And yeah, of course, I'm going to like his Homer slant a little bit, but I don't, he's not like um, the Boston Bruins announcers where even though they're on TV, they are just so Homerish. It's like, Okay, yeah, you can have a Homer opinion because that's what we want. But at the same time, you got to respect the opponent. Yeah. We've been going for about an hour and a half. Not the greatest note to end on us just pooping on broadcasters, but yeah. Sometimes you got to know, you know, the fans don't appreciate you being wrong. Um, Big couple big series this weekend. Uh, all the games are going to matter from here on out. Uh, once again, thank you, Brent, for coming along. We need to figure out how, maybe how to reach out to some other teams because this has been a whole lot of fun getting to know um, more fans from around the conference. Um, maybe not Miami. I don't know. Ohio folks, they're 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 strange fellows. Um, Do they really have a Twitter though? With how bad their team is, no. <laughs> That's not a ter- I really there are very few that have come across my timeline. Um we did get a nice little bump of Omaha fans who I may have offended by constantly referring to you guys as other things. Um <laughs> and not just straight Omaha, which I believe. See, here's the thing. And I again, we're going to do this Midwestern thing cuz we're all Midwestern boys here. You've got Duluth who is apparently offended every time you call them just Duluth. And then Omaha, who is apparently quite satisfied with being referred to as just Omaha, not Nebraska Omaha, just Omaha. So I don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, See, I was thinking, I was thinking about that this weekend. Um, so our rebrand, technically, Nebraska Omaha is fine, but we are technically just Omaha now when it comes to like being referred to as. But I was thinking, like, um, our 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 ribbons for the scoreboard this year said Minnesota Duluth, and I was like, yeah, like Minnesota Duluth. I'm pretty sure that's how they. Like I've I've seen some fans say no, we're Minnesota Duluth, we're not Duluth. So obviously, Mike, you could chime in on this too. I, but I'm I've seen I've seen some people get offended if you just call them Duluth. Yeah, but I think they at one point they literally had a jersey that just said Duluth on it. If you have a jersey that just says the one word on there, suck it. I'm gonna refer to you as that, and you can't tell me that it's offensive because you put it on your own jersey. Eat it yet. Yeah. Well, South, South Canadians. Canadians. If you if you just say like I guess if you say like the Duluth Bulldogs, but at the same time like I've over my years of of getting into hockey and getting into the the conference and everything like it just sounds more correct to say Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs like it just rolls off the tongue. So see, I, I don't and know. <laughs> for me, I mean, I frankly I don't care. Um, it was like. I'm going to call it UMD. That's, I mean, that's just what I grew up calling it. Um, yeah. Cause that's what it is to us, but it's the university of Minnesota Duluth. That's what it is. We are in Duluth. If you call us Duluth, what do I care? The people that are getting offended by that, they can go suck an egg because <laughs> we're Duluth. You call man, Minnesota state Mankato, Mankato. What's, yeah. what's the difference? 
yeah. like that's that's how I refer to him. There was one though. I, I took a picture of it, and it's going to take me forever to find. But I was at the X, and on the scoreboard, how they had it written was so messed up that I don't think they knew what to call us. Because it was like Duluth University of Minnesota or something. I was like... <laughs> Dude, that's, what, that's my whole... What in the world? We also know that I have an issue with the way that Denver refers to itself. Denver, I, Denver yeah, is... You wrote it on your paper. Denver you is on your paper. only Denver. Yeah, I know I did. I was in a hurry when I wrote it. I... I will never refer to them as DU. I will not. I refuse. They you're are the, technically you are the University DUB. of Denver. You are not Denver University. No. It's like, like uh, Miami is not Miami of Ohio. They are the Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and the University of Miami is the one in Florida. No. Yeah. See, we like for us, like with <clears throat> the Nebraska collegiate system like we have UNO and UNL we also have UNK but that's whatever but like I think we obviously we use UNO a lot in our chants and stuff but it's a big thing for us to like not not call us UNO but we're we more like Omaha because that means like we're separating separating ourselves in a way from Nebraska Lincoln so like the more we hear Nebraska Omaha it's like yeah like that is correct but it's more correct now to say just omaha because one it's a whole lot easier to say yeah uh yeah. just because it's i mean most people know us as being from omaha nebraska so to say nebraska omaha like most people probably think we're saying it wrong so like just calling us omaha is perfect like that's great that's the way we want to be called because what i'm not i'm not saying to take offense to it but like you say like the brat you call us nebraska sometimes and like, it's not wrong. We're in Nebraska, but that's just something that 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 can get misconstrued by some people. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, like, you know, like yeah, technically yeah, Nebraska's right, but technically here, Nebraska is down in Lincoln. We call UNL Nebraska because they're the Cornhuskers. Everyone knows yep. the Nebraska Cornhuskers. So calling us Nebraska is like, well, we're not Nebraska, but yeah, I mean that's but like. As long as you have an open mind, I don't, I don't care. Yeah, I, I mean, know it's... who you're talking about, but yeah. at the same time, like some people, even local media, like local newspaper and stuff, they still call us wrong things. We barely get any, any acknowledgement around here unless we're doing really well. Like we just had a story written about Tanner today. And I'm like, wow, that's the first story we've had written about us all season. <laughs> and, and I'm sure the same thing, like, I'm not going to refer to you. Like, I understand the difference of, Duluth and the University of Minnesota. I think they're granted they chose I mean you guys kinda did too. They have the same color pattern other than yours is, has included more black than uh University of Nebraska has. I think they're just purely red and white, but similar color pattern to to some regards. Whereas it's the exact same color pattern for Minnesota Duluth and, and Minnesota. Uh, Ours is just a little darker maroon. Whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying. See, that's a, that's another thing too, though. Like you referred to uh, the Gophers as University of Minnesota, even though it's like what isn't it Minnesota Twin Cities? I mean, technically, but, but the, we always just call it University of Minnesota. Right, and that's the, that's the thing. Like you, that's just how everyone knows it as. So, yeah. You know. Well, but I get like I don't know. I don't know why they get so weird and and butthurt about referring to them by the one differentiator that literally sets them apart from the university that they kind of sometimes want to be a part of but not always and like suck it i'm gonna call you what i call you and you're just gonna have to deal with it at least it's closer than kemp and bump all right like, jesus the, the word the word appears on your name somewhere okay all the letters are there some regard we're not adding extra we're not taking away some we're not completely replacing them anyway <laughs> need to stop being so angry and yeah just... do the thing i'm trying to find this picture but do do the thing yeah let's wrap this up it's been we, we we've gone too long um again thank you for appearing with us it's been another great conversation we'll have to have you on uh depending on what the playoffs look like um 
and if not, we'll, we'll definitely get you on throughout the off season and, and potentially next season. Um, Hopefully, we're all playing someone different. That, that would be nice. That would be fun. Like, we're that not all playing fun. each other, whatever. <laughs> uh, our names have been floating around the bottom of our pictures. We even included uh, Brent's name and his Twitter handle just to be extra nice to him. I don't know where my parentheses went. That's not cool. Um, I don't know why that popped into my head right now. Anyway, can we wrap this up, please? Um, so you could get at any of us on Twitter there. Uh, the show has a Twitter handle that hasn't been scrolling around on the bottom of the screen because this scene does not have one. But that Twitter handle is at Golhorn Fight Song. That's G O A L H R N F I G H T S N G on the Twitters. Uh, there's also a Gmail account. It's all of the letters of Golhorns and Fight Songs squished together to make one big long word. Um, at gmail.com. Yep, that's how that works. Uh, you can email us questions. No one has yet, but it's always an option to do so. There's a like button, a dislike button, a share, a follow, no, a subscribe, not follow, subscribe. On the YouTube, if you wish to use those, you don't have to. I don't care. Make a decision for yourself. Be cool about it or not. Eh, whatever. Um, so we're just going to do this every week, whether you're here or not, because we have nothing better to do on a Tuesday night at 9 o'clock on the East Coast and 8 o'clock Central time for my co-hosts who have been so awesome tonight. Uh, until the next one, bye.